This morning, uh, I'm excited about this message. You know, this summer, uh, we, um, we're not doing any particular series. We're just hitting some hot spots and some hot spots throughout the New Testament that I've picked. Um, and so today, we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 2, hopefully. I, uh, I promise we will in one way or another. But we'll be looking at Colossians chapter 2, and I've titled this message, The Gospel Is. Now, the gospel is, it's interesting that uh, we Christians, we can be Christians for five years, 15 years, 30 years, and yet when someone says, what is the gospel, we could still find ourselves going, well, I mean, you know, well, there's Jesus and the cross. Yeah, but what is Jesus and the cross? Well, I mean, died for our, died, died for our sins. You know, we kind of fumble over our words sometimes. It's not super clear. Where do you send somebody? If you're going to send them, like if you had 10 minutes, where are you going to send somebody in the Bible to understand what the gospel is? What's cool is that Colossians chapter 2 is a great place to do that. And so this morning I've titled this, The Gospel Is, and we're going to see four pillars. In fact, you might have noticed these banners here, these banners in, in this church, they, they represent the four pillars of the gospel. We have forgiveness, we're going to talk about that, freedom, identity, and life. These are the four pillars of the new covenant. Now, if you were going to say, what are the pillars of the old covenant? Well, there's, maybe you'd say there's ten of them, the ten commandments. Or maybe you'd say there's two of them, what God will do, if you do for him, then God will do for you. And that's what the contract looks like. But the new covenant is God, the God of the universe, showering us with his contract. Now, don't forget what this contract looks like. Because God could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. So here you got two guys in a partnership. Guy on the left, his name's God. Guy on the right, his name's God you got two guys in this partnership, God and God. And the book of Hebrews says, by two unchangeable things, we have this hope as an anchor. And then we're scratching our heads and we're saying, well, well what, what, what's my part? Where do, where do I come in? And thank God the answer is, you don't. You don't come into the contract. You, you're a beneficiary. There's an inheritance. There's a benefit to the contract. But you don't ratify it, you don't enact it, and you don't sustain it. And that's what grace is. That's why we needed a new covenant, because we already saw what happened under the old covenant. You got David, a man after God's own heart in the Old Testament, and he's praying prayers like, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He's fearful. He's hesitant. He's saying, create in me a clean heart. His heart's not clean still. Renew in me a right spirit. His spirit's not right. You see, so if you're David, you're living the roller coaster life of the old covenant. You know, give me a new heart. Give me a new spirit. Please don't leave me. Please forgive me. And on and on it goes. Because you're in the contract. You're in the equation. If you do your part, God will do his. Why did Jesus come? To change all that. And that's what we'll see here. We begin in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. It says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Now, what I love about this verse is, number one, here's what you see. There's not two ways to do this. You don't get saved one way and live another way. We are saved by grace through the contract between God and God. And then guess what? We also live the same way. It's not, you're a Christian, now get busy for God. It's you're a Christian by grace through faith, so wake up every day and live by grace through faith. Jesus plus nothing. Therefore, just as you received him, so walk in him. How'd you receive him? Lord, I can't save myself. I can't impress you. I can't live for you. I can't uh, do enough for you. If there's a standard to achieve, is it enough? How do I know it's enough? How do I know I've arrived? If the standard is loving people, how many people do I have to love? 
If the standard is giving money, how much money do I have to give? When is enough enough? And so when you're living with a to-do list, it is no different than the old covenant. It's just the old covenant with a little Jesus hat on it. We'll call Jesus our priest, but we'll impress God through our actions. What this passage is saying is that we got saved by grace through faith, and then how do we live in Him? By grace through faith. Just as you received Him, so walk in Him. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So you see what this is about? It's about a building. And the building starts with a foundation. So if I have a building with a, with a bad foundation, in fact, you know, we lived in South Bend and in certain parts of Lubbock, certainly you can go find a lot of houses, you know, that are crumbling. And so they, they were at one time a beautiful piece, I mean, a beautiful piece of art. In fact, the house we lived in, in South Bend, we sold it five or six years later, we found out that the side of the house had basically fallen off. It was laying on the ground, and so the guy had to, he had to get a new side of the house. I don't know how you express that exactly, but it had, it had crumbled on the side. A foundation is key. If the foundation is not solid, everything else you build on it is not solid. Those of you who live a life as a construction workers, we have a few, you know what I'm talking about. It's all about the base. So if the foundation is, look at me, God, watch my smoke, watch what I'm going to do for you, and you start building on that foundation, it's going to take you one year, ten years, thirty years to figure out, am I okay? Have I done it? Am I right? Am I going to hit heaven when I leave this place? Is, enough, is it enough? And the foundation is built on me. What this is talking about is a totally different foundation. Build your foundation on someone who is not you. Now, to the ego, that's offensive. But to those of us, when we, when we finally see it's got to be this way, it's actually a relief. Thank God it's not about me. Rooted in being built up in Jesus. And established in your faith, just as you were instructed. And what comes out of that? Not a bunch of dry, stale religion. Not a bunch of stiff, lifeless principles. What comes out of that is thank you. Overflowing with thank you. Why thank you? Thank you that it's not about me. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So... Now, look at what this passage is saying here. What are these? These are distractions. That's what they are. They're churchy distractions. They're philosophical distractions. They're religious distractions. And you know, I dare say it, we might actually have some of these in West Texas. <laughs> the Bible Belt, right? You go into Starbucks, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, he's a Christian, I'm okay, you're okay. Yeah, because I live in Texas, man. I mean, we're all Christians in Texas, right? And we got our country club Christianity where, I, you know, I go to church. I log my hour a week. I log two hours. I volunteer. I log three hours, you know. So we're into the, the book and the building and the time. We're into us and what we're doing for God. That is still not being justified by faith alone. You see that? This is what Martin Luther fought for, right? He's mad at the Catholic Church for many of the things they're doing because the Catholic Church at that time was making it about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. Martin Luther, he's sitting there reading the book of Romans. He's saying, wait a minute. It, it, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. And so then he writes up his objections to the Catholic Church, right? So you've got these two philosophies then. Is it about me or is it about him? And it can only be one or the other. 
Don't let anybody take you captive through philosophy, empty deception, tradition. We've always done it this way. Principles of this world. Let me teach you some principles. Don't worry, they're Christian principles. Well, I'm sorry, I don't live by principles. I live by Jesus Christ. I live by a person, not a principle. See, if you try to teach a principle, I mean, what are you going to do? Jesus was, uh, you know, spitting in the dirt, healing people. You say, well, I, I, my principle is I got to be like Jesus, got to walk like Jesus, got to imitate Jesus. Well, Jesus is spitting in the dirt. He's walking across water. He, he's turning furniture over in church. You know, I mean, this idea that we're going to set up a set of behaviors and just imitate Jesus, that's not living from Christ Jesus who lives within us in the moment. And wh what he may be doing in you is different than what he's doing in you and different than what he's doing in you, and we can't control that. We can't legislate that. We can't make that into a set of principles. Now, you know, if you're worried about what I'm saying... Let me assure you, Jesus Christ never leads us to, to harm people, hurt people. There's laws of love that are written on our hearts. Believe in Christ and love one another. These are written in our hearts. And, and so there's a character to this person, isn't there? And we can trust, get this, we can trust the character of the person, Jesus Christ. That's why we don't need philosophy and tradition and rules and principles and dead religion because we have a person and we can trust the person. Now, this is alarming to the legalist, isn't it? You're telling me and instantly they just imagine chaos and immorality and it's because, well, are they acquainted with the person, because I'm not talking about chaos and immorality. I'm talking about Jesus, Jesus plus nothing. And then someone comes along, even after the Apostle Paul 2,000 years ago. Great, heard, glad you heard about Jesus. Fantastic. Let me just give you a few laws now. It's Jesus plus these. It's Jesus plus circumcision. Jesus plus Judaism. Jesus plus principles. Jesus plus tradition. Jesus plus what I have. <laughs> I've got it. You need it. And if you can get the extra that I have, then you'll really be living it. Now, let me tell you, this is a long time ago, but this is today. Is it not? People come knocking. It's great that you're a Christian, but now you need the Spirit. Well, he who has the Son has the life. The Spirit is salvation. The Spirit is the one who makes us new. The Spirit is the one who saved us. It's great that you're a Christian, but now you need this gift, the gift of tongues. You know, Romans, Corinthians, various places, they tell us about these gifts. One of these places, it says, not all have this gift, do they? Not all have this gift, do they? Not all have this gift. There's a diversity and a beauty in the body of Christ. Do you really think that we're going to be up in heaven saying, God, look at how I spoke in tongues. I believe Jesus would turn to us and say, look at how I spoke in love. It's not about you, your hands, your mouth, what you're doing. It's about what he did. And it is enough. So what are we going to see today? Self-improvement, three steps. Uh, I think I said last week you got your Bible cookbooks. You know, we can't have dinner without getting a preacher involved. You got three steps to a Christian dinner. Christian exercise program. I'm, I've got a new uh, exercise program coming out. I'm calling it Pontius Pilates. <laughs> I've got a Roman helmet on, and I'm doing the, you know, whatever it is that they... Wait for that on video. <laughs> you got your trends, your three steps. Watch out for this stuff. You got a church down the street or two or seven. They've got a Jewish class where it's great that you're a Christian, but now we need you to do the festivals if you're really going to get right with God. 
I mean, this is up close and personal. This is in our face. This is real. There really are a lot of distractions. For in him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you've been made complete. What do you do when you're complete? What, what does a kid do when a meal's over? All gone, right? This is the gospel. Your sins are all gone. The obstacles between you and God, all gone. You've been made complete. We talked about that house, that foundation. What goes up next? The walls. What goes up next? The roof. When that job is over, it's complete. Say it's finished. Can't add to it. It's done. And this is what he's saying to us. You've been made complete. A long time ago, a few years ago, I, I shared with some of you um, about our house in South Bend, that same house that's now falling apart. At that time, we bought it. And, um, you know, we were excited about it because it was, a, it was a house that was designed by a student of Frank Lloyd Wright. So it had those, those uh, flat, you know, lines in it, uh, horizontal and vertical lines. It had a sort of a flat-looking roof, had long vertical windows. It was a different style. All the other houses were more Victorian and similar on that street. And we found this house, and it was uh, pretty cheap. We found out later why it was cheap because we were... <laughs> We were robbed three times, and then the side of the house fell off, by the way. <laughs> but, but this house, I mean, when we first moved into this house, you know, it was our first house. We're fresh out of uh, the university life, and uh, we're making our payments, and we're just happy to be in this thing. And it's, it, to us, it's cool. You know, it's 100 years old, and it's different, and it's cool. Now, it's cool because of the reasons I told you, the lines. But now imagine I get out my, uh, my skill saw and uh, get out my sledgehammer and I get out some of my other fancy tools and I just say, I'm going to go at this thing and I'm going to improve it. I mean, you know, these, these squared off sections, they could look so much better if they were kind of rounded. You know, and that roof, it's just too flat. I think we ought to go with an A-frame. And I start messing with a masterpiece. I mean, you're talking about an architect who had a school of architects, a school of architecture and lots of architects under him, and they agreed on a style. And this thing was in that style. And then for me to come along and just alter it and mess with it and improve it, that's absurd. What Paul is telling us here is that you're a masterpiece. That you're, you're not only okay, you're right with God. The architect has designed you, recreated you in Christ Jesus, designed you from the ground up in His style, in His way, and you don't mess with a masterpiece. So when it comes to these trends of self-improvement and focus on self and trying to fix me and you start praying the prayers of the old covenant, clean my heart, change my heart, fix me, fix me, fix me. You can pray those for 10 years, 30 years, 50 years, but the whole point of the gospel is if you've received Christ, he fixed your heart. I give you a new heart, a new spirit, and I put my spirit within you. You're a masterpiece. You've been made complete. So my question is, what does completeness mean to you? Take 10 seconds to just think about that one and maybe take it home with you. What does it mean to you to be complete? You know, to me, it means no more shopping. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. No, not that kind. No more shopping for more of Jesus, more closeness, more forgiveness, more acceptance, more rightness. As I, you know, I like to ask people, if you're going to shop for those things, where are you going to look? And how are you going to know when you got them? Well, next we see a new identity. In him you were also circumcised, heart surgery. Cut out the old heart, new heart put in place. In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So it's like uh, I was telling a kid in, uh, in college. I had a friend uh, across the hall in college, 
And he, you know, I'm trying to talk to him about the gospel. I'm like, what's the gospel? What's the gospel? What's the gospel? To you, getting his response, it's not quite clear. Um, you know, we're trying to understand each other. So then one day I just say to him, you look, I mean, the gospel is this. Y you die and you wake up the next day and you're a new person. I, I can't explain it any differently than that. But you die spiritually. You get a heart transplant. You wake up the next day, you got a new heart, a new set of desires. You've been changed. It doesn't mean you're going to perform perfectly or perform radically differently on the outside, but you know something has happened at the core of your being. You die and you become a new person. That's what this is talking about. Heart removal, heart replacement. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him. So... Uh, now, if you're, if you're understanding what Christianity is then, Christianity is not just Jesus dying for you. Christianity is you dying with Jesus. So when I become a Christian, I spiritually get taken through a process. When I become a Christian, I die, I'm buried, and I'm raised a new person. And this spiritual death, burial, resurrection is what it means to be in Christ. That's what he's talking about here. Now, uh, I know this is a lot, a lot of, there's a lot of depth here. There's a lot of stuff here to consider. But the bottom line is this. Are you looking to something external to make your Christian life work? Or are you looking to something internal to make your Christian life work? Because what Paul is telling us here is, hey, it's not about this stuff on the outside. It's about what's happening on the inside. There's a surgery, a forgiveness, an identity, a life, a DNA swap, a heart surgery, and it's internal, and you live from there. You can't live from out here with the tablets of stone and with the festivals and with the, the religious principles. It's not about what's out here. It's about what's in here. So this is what he's talking about, and uh, as we finish up, we're going to see two more things. A new kind of forgiveness and new life, too. You were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. What did he do for you? He made you alive. And how many sins did he forgive? All. All of your sins. So did he forgive just the small ones? Did he forgive just the big ones? He forgave the small and the big. Did he forgive... Yesterday's sins, yes. Did he forgive today's sins? Yes. Did he forgive tomorrow's sins that you haven't even dreamed up yet? See, tonight you could plan out some sins. <laughs> now, look at this timeline now. Past, present, future. How many of these sins did he forgive? And guess what? All of them were in the future when Christ died. How many of your sins were in the future when Christ died? All of them. Did he say, I'll forgive them until salvation, and then it's up to you to keep short accounts with God? If that were true, the gospel just got worse for you. You should not become a Christian till the end of your life, maybe, because then there's few to deal with. You see that? So it's not about past, present, or future. It's about all sins being forgiven. As Hebrews puts it, one sacrifice for all. Now, if you're following me then, this is crazy. Because I just told you if you dream up sins tonight, that your sins tomorrow are already forgiven. Now, that sounds like a license to sin, doesn't it? Well... And I could see you abusing that license. I, I, I couldn't see me. I could just see you abusing that license. Except for there's more to the verse. Did you see the previous line? See, what if God's not dumb in forgiving you of, of all your sins? What if he also gave you a new set of desires? You see, when I hear about total forgiveness of all my sins, past, present, and future... I start thinking, well, gosh, I can do whatever I want. So then I start asking, well, what do I want? 
See? And until I see that liberty, I'll never really understand what I want. Because I'm living for mom, I'm living for dad, I'm living for public uh, opinion, I'm living for impressions, I'm look, living for the people that are looking. And when I finally see past, present, and future are forgiven and I can do whatever I want, then I have to ask, well, what do I really want? And then I see the need for Jesus Christ to have come into my life and changed what I want. God's not naive here. There's more to the gospel than total forgiveness. There's new life. Having canceled out the certificate of debt, that means you don't owe God. No, you owe God money. You owe God your best. And there's an offering plate at the back. <laughs> if you don't give your first fruits... Bring it into the storehouse, Malachi 3. If you give, God will give back to you tenfold. Tell that to the guy in southern India laying in the street with leprosy. This American, you know, new, modern, American dream of a gospel where it's about health and wealth, that's a fabrication. This gospel is 2,000 years old. This idea that God's going to make you rich and healthy all the time is very, very, very young. A very young deception. So, you know, while the American dream is great, you know, two cars in every garage and a television in every home and that sort of thing, it's great that our nation can prosper and be strong. But when it comes to Jesus Christ and what he wants to communicate to the Corinthians and the Romans and the Thessalonians and the Spanish and the Americans and the Canadians. Yeah, even the Canadians. <laughs> Here's the deal. It's not about us, you know, putting our quarters in the slot machine and pulling down the handle and out comes the blessings. The Bible in the New Testament, it says, give freely from the heart, not under pressure. And that applies to living too, doesn't it? Live freely from the heart, not under pressure. So he canceled the certificate of debt. We don't owe God. He took it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, who's that? I don't know. I mean, it could be the Jewish rulers and authorities of that day. It could be the spiritual authorities, you know, the spirits, the decept the deceivers. But the point is this. All of that accusation says you owe God. And Jesus is saying, you're off the hook. I paid it in full, not in part. He made a public display, having triumphed over them. And lastly, we see a bit of freedom. Therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? Here's the finale. Don't let anybody judge you. Man, the Bible says this? Come on. Yeah, the Bible speaks against judging people. And yet the Bible has been the thing that people have taken and lifted up high over their heads and then just beat people with it. And yet the true message in the scriptures is this. You're free in Christ. You're forgiven. You're accepted. You're loved. And you're never, ever alone. And you're complete in Him. Therefore, don't let anybody beat you up about this food or that drink or this Sabbath day or this festival or this tradition or this principle. It's about Jesus. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by telling you about what they worship or how they treat themselves. We're almost done here. Check this out. These are interesting. People come up, up to you and say, I've had a vision. Let me tell you about my vision. God's got a word for you from me. God told me to tell you. Right? So you need me now, see? God told me to tell you a secret. 
So, you know, there's people that are taking their stand on visions. There's distractions in worship. All kinds of things inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. And not holding fast to the head. That's the foundation. That's Jesus Christ from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments. Here it is. Grows with a growth which is from God. Now, I don't know about you, but have you noticed that we're in a drought? I mean, we're in a drought in West Texas. In West Texas, there is a serious lack of rain lately, right? And now, you know, we, we pray for rain and we hope for rain because the reality is nothing grows without rain. Now, you see what this is saying here. I mean, it's, it's similar, isn't it? God has set it up so that a sprinkle of rain falls on the soil, and from that soil it comes up uh, fruit, plants, vegetables, life. Life comes out of the soil when there's water to water it. Now, what this is saying is you're not going to get life from effort, from principles. You're not going to get life from self-improvement. You've got to get life from a source that is not you. So fuel up. Soak it in. This water is the truth of the gospel, and that's why we're here this morning. Soak it in. You're forgiven. You're freed. You're accepted. You're loved. You're okay. You know that's what righteousness is? Modern American English, it's you're okay. But I need to hear that I'm okay. Because I forget. The world doesn't tell me I'm okay. My performance doesn't always tell me I'm okay. So I need to hear and receive and then receive. And from that, fruit is born. The growth which comes from God. If you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world... Why in the world are you submitting to a bunch of rules? Yeah, this is in the Bible too. Why are you submitting to a bunch of rules? Do not handle this. Do not taste this. Do not touch this. By the way, we've got a new piece of art going up out on the wall out there. You know, the front wall, and it's almost done. But I just wanted to tell you guys, keep off. <laughs> Especially the little ones. If you climb up on that art... It will probably fall to the ground, pieces of it breaking off. So I thought the best thing was to give you a rule, <laughs> thou shalt not climb on the new art. <laughs> now, there's about four of you right in this moment. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. You're planning exactly how you're going to get up that artwork. And you're under the age of 10. <laughs> and you can see me after. But this is the thing. Boy, those rules. Do not, do not, do not. They sound so good. In fact, what does it say in the next verse? They have the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion, self-abasement, severe treatment of the body, but they are of no value against fleshly indulgence. You know, people freak out about their struggle. You're addicted to something abusing something, you're trapped in something, you can't get away from it, here's a crazy thought. Maybe I'm enslaved to it because of the way I've tried to escape it. Have I been trying to escape it by a bunch of rules, principles, laws, a bunch of do-nots? If you're trapped in something, consider the method of escape. Is it? something that has the appearance of wisdom but doesn't actually work. They couldn't keep the laws for thousands of years. God is saying the new way is me, not laws. Jesus, a person, not principles. The gospel is forgiveness, freedom, identity, and life. The gospel is a celebration. Let's pray together.